thanks everyone uh, to coming uh, to my talk. Uh, I'll be speaking about a project of which I've been slightly involved in. Uh, actually, most of the work is done by other people from many institutions. The people from my company are listed on, uh, on this slide. Uh, I'm very uh, happy to give the first talk so I don't have to work on my slides any longer. And uh, I guess I was picked because maybe this talk is somewhat the odd one out. Um, right, so I'm gonna talk about data centers, mostly custom data centers, so data centers that companies own. So there's a couple of companies that you can imagine might own their own data centers. That's, uh, and so we have racks and racks of machines. Uh, they're all very nice. Um, um, just that they, they, they come with, uh, they're all ni nicely and well connected. Uh, but they're actually somewhat fully async asynchronous. Like they have every every machine has their own clock or their own PLL or crystal or whatever. You have hordes of penguins who are hopefully coordinating together. They're all managing their own clock as well. You have some other nice uh, uh, scheduling uh, and uh, there's queues everywhere. And this concept leads to something called like the tail latency. So latencies across machines are not always the same. And so a number, if you're serving requests, then a number of requests can take very long. And if you are a gamer, then this might bother you a lot because this is the thing that can cause lag spikes. Um, but let's say you are operating a uh, hosted video game surface, mm -hmm. uh, which some companies used to do in the past and some still do, then this will also be a problem for you. Um, that was actually not the main reason uh, wh why we were looking at, um, at lag spikes. Um, there are actually many, many applications that run in a, in a distributed fashion and we need to schedule them across you know, these across basically an entire data center because we want to use all the compute efficiently. But it becomes very hard if you don't know how long it takes before a message to arrive at another computer. You can try and build a large queue, but that will just add a lot of latency and maybe you're just waiting all the time. Um, so that's where uh, this project comes in. It's called uh, BitTide. And what we want to do is basically treat a data center almost as if it were, you know, the same way you should think about circuits. We want to have synchronous executions of all tasks that run across the data center uh, for cheap. Um, and what we don't want is uh, have a central clock that we want to distribute to all of the machines because uh, that's very hard to keep track of. Um, so what we, instead of what the BitTide project does is we, we monitor the frequency of our neighbors. And since this is 2024, uh, everything is 10 gigabits and up. So everything is serial communication these days. And these serial lines, they don't provide you with a clock. Everybody does clock and data recovery. So distributing the clock is just talking to one another because then you get your neighbor's clock, basically. So we see all of the incoming data and we sort of average out and then we adjust, looking at the frequency of our, of our the, the frequency that our neighbors speak, we just adjust our own. And then together with some elastic buffers to absorb phase wobble, uh, we get a something called uh, a shared notion of logical time and different from wall clock time. But that's really sufficient to, uh, to schedule your you know, distributed applications at the data center scale. We don't care about wall clock, we just care about what clock cycle a message arrives. And so we, we can just absorb any phase wobble uh, using small FIFOs. And so what logical time does is it, it gives you a mapping from uh, a clock in one system to a clock in another system. Uh, and this is really more, 
uh, more like the clock of, you know, the, the clock as we as circuit designers know, not the clock that most people know, like the clock that's there over on the, on the side of the room. So again, what logical time is not, if we have a node A that sends at, you know, atomic clock universal coordinated time uh, two in the morning, and then B receives it uh, two milliseconds later, again, reference to, to some atomic clock. Um, so what is logical time is node A sends a message at clock cycle 1.2 million 800, reference to its own clock, and then the message, and it's sending it to B, by the way, and then B receives it at clock cycle uh, 4,600,808, for example, reference to its own clock B. An external observer can now uh, see, or they, you know, the, the, the systems can communicate towards, let's say, a central scheduler, that you know, if, we, if A sends them something at clock cycle X, then we just have to translate that to uh, X plus 3,400,008, cycles later on B, and this will be sufficient for any scheduler to figure out uh, when messages will arrive at clock cycle accuracy. Um, but also it can mean, let's say, uh, our destination machine started up later. So node A sends something at clock cycle 1.2 million, but it arrives at clock cycle B uh, 100,000. So then we sort of get like a negative offset. Um, and that's fine. You should just never interpret these numbers as anything that has a, you know, a physical, in, in physical terms. It's not wall clock latency. It's just a translation from one system to another that will be guaranteed always. The only time that we can interpret these uh, logical latencies as a physical latency is if we do a round trip time. So if we send something to one node and then we get it back, then we know exactly according to our own, you know, the, the node's own local reference, how long it took to do a complete round trip. So how, did, how does this work? So we have uh, 30s basically, uh, we, we're all talking at least 10 gigabit ethernet, uh, I think uh, there's, we're working now, or just, I think the next standard will be 1.6 terabits uh, for every connection, 800 Gs. With 400 Gs common now, 800 Gs coming, 1.6 will be the next. But anyways, we're all talking uh, 30, so we all get our neighbor's clocks. And so we have a FIFO and we're communicating with one another. So if the FIFO goes beyond the midpoint, basically, because we, we just try to keep the data at the midpoint. But if it goes above the midpoint, what does that mean? That means that our neighbor is producing slightly faster than we are consuming. So that means we have to raise our own clock frequency so that it will basically go back to the midpoint. If, if it turns out that the, um, the FIFO, it goes below the midpoint, then that means that we are consuming faster than our neighbors are than our neighbors producing, and as a result, we have to lower our frequency so that the buffer will fill up again to the midpoint. So it's very imp so basically keeping this buffer at the midpoint is very important because if we underflow, we're just reading data uh, garbage from the FIFO, and if we if the FIFO overflows, then we'll basically lost the uh, 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 data. So it's important to stay within bounds. Um, so at, at QBA Logic, we built a, a demo setup uh, existing out of uh, eight uh, uh, Xilinx uh, Kintex UltraScale boards that are connected through multiple means. That's why you see these massive cables. So we have optical, we have SMA directly, we have so direct attached. Oh. And um, uh, we have some uh, clock boards that, that uh, run uh, PLLs, in this case from, from Skyworks. Uh, and these are PLLs with a digital controlled oscillator, so that means we can do the small frequency increase and decrease.
But if you look at many of your FPGA boards from at least the two large vendors, so Altera these days again and AMD, they usually have a Silicon Labs PLL that can be finely adjusted. So they're very common actually on, uh, on FPGA boards. Um, and I'll, I'll run a quick video to, to demonstrate uh, what's going on. So we're looking at a system now with clock control running. Uh, I just got a, a hand dryer in my hand and I'm gonna uh, warm up the clock boards. Very professional. As you can see, the clocks run away very, very quickly. So I'm going to release the reset again. And you can see the clocks synchronizing again. Yep. All right. Uh, yeah. So, OK. We, we, we've done this project uh, uh, in Clash uh, so far. Uh, Clash is a uh, compiler that translates uh, Haskell to VHDL uh, and or system Verilog. Uh, it does a semantic subset, and this subset means that we need to be able to determine the exact resource usage up front. Uh, so no uh, resource usage that, that's sort of decided at runtime. Uh, Clash is not HLS, so we don't go from untimed specifications to timed specifications, uh, but we need to insert our sequential elements by ourselves. This means we sort of keep uh, control of how much resource we use and we can stay efficient. Uh, we've done some experiments against handwritten Verilog uh, that for one from one of our clients, and we could for ASIC we could stay uh, within one um, uh, one percentage. Uh, increase uh, for area and stay the same for all the other parameters. Uh, so the benefits of uh, Clash for this project is that we, uh, 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 well, there are multiple clocks involved and Clash ch checks the CDC, uh, uh, tracks the, the clock domain the signal belongs to at the type level. So we get early, early warnings if we accidentally cross a clock domain. Uh, Clash has support to track pipeline depth of operators and, and also, if you want to, you can ask it to um, uh, match up the pipeline depths if you combine operators. Um, and yeah, so that, that helped with this system because the, um, the clock control algorithm currently runs in floating point, and so we have different operators have with different pipeline depths, and there was never any mismatch uh, because of that. Um, and because, well, it's all in Haskell, which is a general purpose functional programming language, and we got to re reuse the types and the functions that we had for the circuit description and for the analysis for, for some plots, which I will not show in this, uh, this presentation. Um, right, so in, in conclusion, so what the bit type system gives us is uh, we can now do ahead of time, time multiplexing at data center scale. Um, at clock cycle accuracy, basically. Um, and there's no communication overhead. Uh, you know, we just send messages and we get the, the FIFO is always there in the 30s. Um, uh, and we, all we need to do is observe the clocks, basically. Um, yeah, like I said, the transceivers already have CDR, but those are prevalent for modern networks. 10 gigabits and up have transceivers with CDR. And we just need a PLL with a digital controlled oscillator so we can do the, the frequency steps up and down. Uh, again, if we look at FPGAs, they're, they're very prevalent as well. 
all of this is uh, open source, I think, uh, and most we try to do as much uh, on the open source side as possible. Well, we're using Kintex UltraSkill, so there's a, the last step where we're somewhat currently limited, but we've used Clash and everything is open source. Yeah, so open source driving innovation, and uh, that's thanks to this, among others, this community. That's it. If you want to want to learn more about BitTight, that's the, the top URL. If you want to learn more about Clash, the bottom URL. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Cheers. Thanks, Christian. Um, one question is, what frequency were those clocks running out in that demo? Uh, that's uh, 200 megahertz. 200 meg. OK, cool. Yeah. All right. Um, um, and then it's, I think, the the links were operating at 10 times that, so 2 gigahertz. Yeah. OK. Uh, yeah. And, and then earlier in the slides, you were talking about a node. So right. is a node like an entire kind of like data center blade or just one CPU or? Uh, one, one CPU currently. One, one CPU. Yeah, okay. yeah that's, that's, yeah, one CPU. That, that's the idea. Yeah. And why is oh, it? Well, well, one thing that has the reference clock. Yeah. So every so the the reference clock that can be controlled. Got it, got it. Uh, and why is it important that you don't underrun? Because uh, if you underrun, you just stop reading, right? Whereas if you overflow or overrun, then you might might lose data. Um, right. Uh, if you uh, underrun, then sort of tokens disappear from the network. Uh, and from a scheduling point of view, yeah. you don't want to underrun. Uh, like you want to have predictable, uh, yeah, you want, to, you want to have causality and predictability in a way. So if you underrun, then you, you suddenly stop. Or you, so underrunning is, let's say, dynamic behavior, which we don't want. We, want. we want everything to be static and everything should be predictable. Like even DRAM timing is predictable. We don't, for DRAM refreshes, we don't have some antenna that picks up electrons and then suddenly refreshes, right? So it's, everything is predictable. Uh -huh. uh, is this only for Clash, for your full system in Clash, or can it be combined with, with the other RTO project or...? Uh, so, yeah, so this is just uh, the clock control that I demonstrated now, but uh, so the clock control algorithm, we, we start actually moving it to software and that runs in, that runs on the VEX risk and eventually like this, this whole clock control should hopefully be just a minor addition. So the, for the companies that can afford to build their own data centers and also divide, develop their own silicon, this should just be a very minor addition. Um, yeah, so for ASIC development. I think you also meant if you can like have black boxes of Verilog in Clash, right? Or like Sorry? how do you combine Clash with other languages there? Um, or just generate Verilog and then... Combine? Yeah, there, there's... There's like there's five different ways currently to integrate Verilog into Clash. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this looks very useful. Uh, also thinking about uh, White Rabbit, have you uh, do you have any comparisons with White Rabbit? Because that's kind of in the same same area, right? Um, somewhat. So White Rabbit is very much about synchronizing to an atomic clock. What is uh, White Rabbit? A white, yeah, white rabbit is a, white rabbit is used, for example, for the square kilometer array to combine uh, data from physically very separate locations and doing you know, like beam forming and combining it. And they also use it at CERN for the Large Hadron Collider. Yeah, it was developed at CERN. It's one yeah. of the like big open source silicon projects from 2010 or so. Yeah. Um, right, but it, it's different in that they try to uh, they they do try to have wall clock. And, and need to pay for. I think they use P, uh, PTP, which is all is just in-band signaling, and they, they care about very much about the phase relations. So that's something that BitTai does not do. Uh, yeah. So we we are very good for distributed applications, but if you need to uh, relate things against the wall clock time, then BitTai is not for you. Okay. One last question. No, no, no. no that's it. I mean, ah, yeah, we're done. Because there's a time over. Yeah. Last question. Wait a second. Uh, thank you. Um, so if you have two servers, are they both controlling their clock speeds? Or is it just there's one master server and everything else is aligning to that? So it's completely distributed. Everyone is controlling their own reference clock. 
So do you have any stability problems with huh? that? Um, no, the, no. Uh, so we, we can have wobble, and that's fine, because the, the, the fibers will absorb it. There could be a that everybody drifts up slightly. You, let's say you're all trying to run at 250 megahertz, but then you could sort of, we might, there might be drift up, so we might have to limit that, but then it will go down. Uh, we haven't observed at least that they would try and drift out of the, uh, the spec range. We, yeah. you, you are trying to run at 250 megahertz or 500 or whatever. It's just that because of temperature variations and process variations, you have slight wobble. Uh, we'll be tired, yeah. Okay, let's thank Christian again. Thanks.